Well, my message today is going to, uh, let me just say, we should have seat belts on these pews. And this is kind of a forerunner of the message. Doers always do it. Doers always do it. They hear the word, that's how it starts. Then it moves into their hearts when they do it. Doubters only hear it. Doubters only hear it. The word brings life to whom it's told, but it can't help a stubborn soul. Just do it. Sinners won't receive it. Sinners won't receive it. They hear the word, they don't obey, they just go on their merry way, they don't do it. Jesus was a doer. Jesus was a doer. In flesh he came, he is the word, so he could be both seen and heard when he did it. Doers always do it. Doers always do it. They hear the word, that's how it starts. Then it moves into their hearts when they do it. Yes, they hear the word, that's how it starts. Then it moves into their hearts when they do it. Okay, two weeks ago I started with the first part of a three-part series where I introduced the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Last week we looked closer at the Ten Commandments. And this week I'm going to go to the middle of the Ten Commandments. And some of you are going to be surprised, perhaps, but... Some of you won't be surprised because you've heard the same sort of thing here for a long, long time, just in a different way. Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17 says, Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. That's the Jews. That's the Jews, right? It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Remember that. Now, does God get tired? Hmm, interesting. But it says on the seventh day, and what's seven? Jim just told us about seven. Seven is the number of completion, right? He finished, it was complete, and he rested, which means that he stopped doing what he was doing, right? It wasn't me that it didn't mean he was tired. <clears throat> the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright in the words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In this third part of the Decalogue series, I look closely, closely at the fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Well, here is a commandment that has caused division and confusion within the visible church for quite some time now. It has been argued by some that it is a key component in man's relationship to God. You know, I won't argue that, but in what way? And that the Christian who doesn't observe it literally is lacking and will never enter God's rest. I could almost agree with that statement too. If you know what it is. Have you ever wondered if all that's true? I know I did. I mean, I, I heard about the, hey, brother, you better worship on a Saturday. But because if you're not worshiping on a Saturday, you're going to go to hell. 
they, they continue with that. I went down downtown to a Seventh-day Adventist meeting a while back, you know, Seventh-day, Saturday. Went down there to that meeting, and uh, it was supposed to be about revelation, prophecy revelation, but it wasn't. It was a, chem it was a, a, a smoke job, yeah. It was smoke screen. What they were trying to do was get that Saturday Sabbath in there, you know? Well... <clears throat> I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I wasn't very gracious. So why does God seem to hold the Sabbath in such high esteem that he ordered those who violated to be put to death? It's serious. As usual, a good place to start is with the meaning of the word Sabbath itself. Sabbath comes from a root that means to rest. Yeah, it does, absolutely which causes many to jump to the conclusion that God is telling us to take time off. Relax. Right? But the meaning of the word rest is not limited to relaxation or taking it easy. From the Hebrew root, nuah, N-U-A-H, it says to dwell or to remain, to rest, to dwell. How about that? To dwell, to live to remain, to rest. And the Greek word, katapuo, which means to colonize. How about that? To colonize. Or to rest or to desist. That is stop. Stop. And even the English word rest means trust or confidence as well as taking it easy. To rest in him is to trust him, to have confidence in him, right? So the significance of the fourth commandment is twofold. First, it is political in that it was an integral part of the glue that bound Israel as a cohesive entity throughout the centuries, along with circumcision and dietary practices. And why? Because Israel was important to be established as the line for the Messiah to come through, right? They had to keep separate from their neighbors. They had to remain true to God's message in order for the Messiah to come through. If the Messiah didn't come, then nobody would be saved. Not Jew, nor Gentile. So it was important that there be a line for the Messiah to come through. And, you know, history has to be there on that side too. Because if it wasn't, how could you prove that he was the Messiah? You couldn't. More about that in a little bit. <clears throat> and second, it was a spiritual, it was spiritual in that it was an ordinance that pointed to a spiritual truth that was only to be realized or revealed in Jesus as the new covenant. The Jews still don't know that. They still don't know that it's a shadow of a reality that would be manifest in Uniquely in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that one day they'll realize that. But they don't realize it yet. And they're still stuck on Saturday. When we went to Israel, you couldn't even get in an elevator without having to press. Well, just stand there and wait for the elevator to stop on every floor. Because you couldn't press a button. When you go into a motel room, the lights turn themselves on and off. Uh, there was a little uh, console beside the bed. It was like a little uh, computer where you had to program what you wanted to, when you wanted the TV to come in and come on and turn off and all that before Saturday. Because on Saturday, nothing worked. It was all, <laughs> it was all automatic. So they took it literally. They really did. Well, they had no choice. Christ hadn't come. They had no idea what it was all about. But we have no excuse, folks. We have no excuse. We continue to blunder along. Well, hopefully we'll see things a little differently today, okay? Amen. Ordinances and traditions are not spiritual truths, even though they are often treated as if they are spiritual truths. Now, we've got that in the church, too, don't we? We think that, you know, we don't do some little ceremony and it, it, it means something. 
The best that a ceremony means is to point you toward a reality that it represents. You follow me? The trouble is people perform their ceremonies with no regard for what that ceremony is actually pointing toward. And as a result, amounts to nothing. It's like praying and having your prayers fall on the floor. All these things like ceremonies and, uh, and traditions, they're just examples or representations of, that, of something that points to a reality, a reality, a spiritual truth. And when the externals, that is, those things that we do, right, energy of the flesh, when the externals are performed without regard for the purpose or the meaning within, that is, what is the spiritual significance of that which we perform, then what's the result? Legalism. Legalism. Do this. Don't do that. You know? Um, legalism is not good because legalism feeds pride. Right? <laughs> Remember the Pharisee who thanks God that he is not a tax collector. Right? Thank you, Lord, that I'm not a tax collector. I've also heard of a Pharisee who said, Thank you, Lord, that I am neither a Gentile nor a woman. It is the dividing point between two distinct categories of the Decalogue as a Levitical ordinance, ceremonial practice. The Sabbath is unique in the Ten Commandments. Talking about man's responsibility to his God and also man's responsibility to his fellow man. And in this sermon, I hope to show to all but the most implacable, that is, unteachable believers, that the literal observance of the Sabbath or any other ceremonial practice prophesies, profits the this, this Christian very little. There is some profit in doing these things, yes, because it's like practicing. But until you understand what it is you're practicing for, you may, you may as well be shadow boxing. It's not doing you any good. All it do, the only good that can come out of it is discipline. You do learn discipline. That's why Catholics make very good Christians when they come out of Catholicism. Because Catholicism teaches what? Discipline. Discipline. We evangelicals, we're all wishy-washy. Everything is fine. Grace, 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 grace. It's all about our grace. Because the problem is that most evangelicals are not taught that grace is not just unmerited favor. It's God's character taking up residence in the believer. So that now I become, you become an instrument of that grace, that character. Yes, not just not just unmerited favor. Oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, no, it's Lord flowing through you and out to the community. Yeah. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. What's godliness? Being like God. That's grace. Grace is the divine influence on your heart and its manifestation in your life. That's what it is. For bodily exercise, that is, ceremonies and rituals, profit a little. Yeah, they produce, you know, discipline. But godliness is profitable for all things. That is, acting like God is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, context reveals that these passages have to do with the vanity of ceremonial practices rather than a contrasting of athletics and spiritual pursuits. Colossians, in Colossians 2.16, Paul writes, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding festivals 
or a new moon or Sabbaths. 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 In fact, Hosea 2.11 regarding Israel's ordinances, God tells, or he says, I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons, her Sabbaths, all her appointed feasts. Why? Why would he do that when they are the very things that he gave them to do? The simple answer is because Israel had done with them the same thing that they had done with the Ark of the Covenant. They had treated them like talismans. Treated them like good luck charms, like rabbit's foots. They wore their ordinances proudly like badges of achievement. And they thought of them as good luck charms. Pride. It produces pride. And remember, pride goes before a fall, right? They were legalists, mistaking the shadow for the reality, seeing only the surface they desired so as to impress and impose control on themselves and on others. See, legalists are all about control. Control, control, control. The same can be seen today in the claims of various groups within the visible church. You must keep the Sabbath. You must eat this. You must not eat that. You must speak in tongues. Now, I speak in tongues, but it ain't necessary. Okay? It's a groovy thing, but it's not necessary for your salvation, folks. What it'll do is it will enhance your worship, absolutely. But it's not necessary for your salvation. If it was, Jesus' sacrifice would be of no use. Now, I'm not saying don't speak in tongues, folks. If you want to, fine. But don't let anybody put you down if you don't. Amen? I'm telling you, it's a great thing to have. It's for your edification. The Word of God says that. It's for your edification. It's for your build up, to build you up. But it's not necessary for your salvation. Okay. These are just a few of the many issues that have brought division and hindered Christian fellowship for many years. Just a few. There are so many things that bring about division within the body of Christ. So many things. You know, Romans chapter 14, it starts out by saying, don't get caught up in doubtful disputations. People do. I heard on the radio today, uh, not, it was yesterday, just uh, something about uh, in Genesis chapter 3, where it says that uh, the seed of the woman would come. And it was an argument. Does that mean, you know, well, of course, a lot of people say, well, the seed is not of the woman, of course, it's of the man, and that's speaking of the, of the virgin birth. But apparently there's an argument within a church that, uh, you know, it's that. And yet the Hebrew actually says the child or the offspring. Hmm. You get division over this. Oh, well, it says offspring. No, it says seed. You know, it doesn't matter. You can read elsewhere where it means offspring. Seed means offspring, right? Like Jacob's. Anyway, enough for that. All I'm saying is that there's all sorts of division, nitpicking that goes on in the church. We, we, what is it? They, they say we, we major on the minors, you know, and very, we, we need to really bring our focus right back to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And let him take care of the rest. Yes, sir. Romans 14 verses 17 to, eight, to 18 tells us that the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved of, him, of men. I might add that the kingdom is not a certain day or period of relaxation. 
The kingdom of God is the realm in which the king functions. And the Lord Jesus and his righteousness should be the only issue for a Christian. As it says in Colossians 2.9, For in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You can't know God unless you know Christ. Jesus is God revealed to man. You've heard me say it before. God, the creator of everything. You look up in the sky and you can only see a portion of the universe that he created. And those little dots up there are galaxies, light years across. You know, when you think about that, what can you have in common with a being that does that? And as somebody once said, I, I liked it. There's a little, uh, there's a tract about this where God became an ant, you know. You think about how would an ant relate to me? How could I really relate to an ant? But God came, became an ant. You know, isn't that incredible? He became one of us so that we would know him as we know each other. You know, there's a, a line in a song we've been hearing to lately that the things of earth are compared to him like a candle to the sun. And even that falls short. But he poured himself into flesh and blood that we would know him. Praise his holy name. Jesus identified himself as the Lord of the Sabbath in Luke 6, 5. So what did he mean? I pondered on that question, and the Lord has revealed a measure of understanding to me on this. Over the years, I've delighted in sharing portraits of Jesus and his mission in the scriptures as God has revealed them to me. To discover this picture of Jesus as the Lord of the Sabbaths, we have to go back, all the way back to the tabernacle in the wilderness. The tabernacle in the wilderness is fabulous, just fabulous. In Exodus 26 and 27, those are two chapters, don't turn there, they're, big, they're long chapters and they're very involved. But in Exodus 26 and 27, you can check them out, check them out later, we can read about the construction of the tabernacle. But let's go to Exodus 26, verse 33. We're told there about the curtain that divided the tabernacle into two distinct portions. Right? You shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between for be, you between the holy place and the most holy. Okay. The holy place and the most holy. Now I'm going to try to get into this somewhat, and I know it can be a little bit tricky, but let me tell you, first of all, it's not about the measurements. It's about the proportions of the measurements. Because in these passages we find the tent of the meeting and that's the tabernacle proper, has 30 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits. Now, we don't know whether that cubit was an 18-inch cubit or a 20-inch 20 20 inch cubit because they came out of Egypt and there was a difference between the Egyptian cubit and the, uh, and the Hebrew cubits. But I don't care. It doesn't matter. I will say this, though, that the um, measurements that are given in the tabernacle, uh, the proportions only come out in our measurement system, not metric. Isn't that interesting? The proportions will not work in the metric system, but they do work in the system that we use. And I know most of the world says, you Yanks, you just don't, you've got to stay your own way. You know, everybody else is going to the metric system, but you know, us, metric, but it's interesting that the system we use will work in proportion 
with the tabernacle for all the prophecies, but not the metric system. That's just a little something. All right. <laughs> now, there seemed to be some confusion as to whether the cubits were 18 or 20, as I said. But for the, our purpose, it doesn't matter because what is of interest in this study is the proportions of the two compartments, that is the tent of the holy place and the holy of holies. Now, we've got a little uh, diagram up here, I think, if we can come bring that. There we go. Now, the holy of holies is twice, exactly twice the size of the holy place. And just off the top of my head, I want to tell you that the holy place is a cube. It's 10 by 10 by 10. It's a cube. Now, what I find interesting about that is the new heavens that come out is a cube. Yeah, it's a cube that comes down. Yeah. So anyway, what you have here is the first three commandments correspond to the place of God. The last six commandments are correspond to us. Right? Now between God and us is a veil. Something is separating God and man. This is the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is right there as a veil. And I'm going to go through here. This is a little tricky to do this, but I'm going to try to explain it all to you as we go along. The, the first three, three is a number of divinity. You all know that, right? And six is the number of man. Okay? And three is twice the size of six. Right? So we have the first three commandments about God in the Holy of Holies. And we have the last six commandments about man in the holy place. And again, dividing the two is number four, the Sabbath. Now, does that mean that the, the, the contact between God and man is by relaxation? Oh, I know, it says, be still and know that I am God. But that's not what we're talking about here. Let me unfold this for you as best I can. There is a wealth of prophecy and spiritual symbolism in the tabernacle. But what I want to show you is the correspondence between the tabernacle and the Decalogue. The Exodus record tells us that the holy place was 20 by 10 by 10 cubits, while the Holy of Holies is 10 by 10 by 10. Again, the Holy of Holies is a cube, the holy place, which is where man comes to meet God, but God can only be met in the holy of holies, right? You know, in, in the holy place, you have the menorah, which uh, Jim just told you this morning, uh, represents a church. Why does it represent a church? It's seven lampstands, right? Seven. There's one right in the middle. That's Christ. One. And the three on either side, six, man and God in one. And what's he do? He gives the light of the place. It's the only light in the place. Okay? There's so much. I'm not, I can't go into all of this, but there's so much to, that in, the, in the tabernacle in the wilderness. The prophecy is incredible. We can readily see from these dimensions that the holy place is exactly twice the size of the Holy of Holies. And the veil that separated the two spaces, or the two places, corresponds to the position of the fourth commandment in the Decalogue, which is the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath holy. And just as the veil is the dividing between the place of the presence of God and the place of the worshiper, the fourth commandment forms the division between God's responsibility to God and to his neighbor. Okay, I'm repeating, but I have to do that. So how many would see nothing but a coincidence here? And I know a lot of people would say, oh, what an amazing coincidence. But in this, we see another example of how integrated God's work is. God's word, God is incredibly integrated in his word. It all fits together. 
it's like dots and you're, you're connecting all those dots and my God, it's Jesus. <laughs> wheels within wheels of metaphor after metaphor showing us the supernatural nature of God's word. The division between God and the worshiper as represented by the curtain and later by the temple veil continued until it was removed by the propitiation of Jesus in yes. Matthew 27, 51. And from this point on, the worshiper can come with confidence into the presence of God and that's Hebrews 4.16. Why? Because the veil was removed. Yeah. The separation was removed. And what is it that separates man from God? It's the flesh. The flesh. Wait, we're going to get there. At the same time that Jesus ripped away the sin barrier that separated us from God, the fourth commandment was removed as an ordinance and we no longer need to approach him in the Levitical fashion. King David confessed in Psalm 51, 17 that the sacrifices that please God are not ceremony, not ritual, a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And again, in Colossians 2, 16 to 17, it says, Let no one judge you in food or drink regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Amen. I hope that I've made this clear enough. The fourth commandment is not a special day, whether Saturday or Sunday. So much for the legalistic position. This leaves us with the taking an easy and relaxation position held by many believers. As I said at the beginning of this sermon, the word rest has the additional meaning of trust or confidence or to finish something. One thing remains to be said about the Sabbath. What did Jesus mean when he said in Mark 2.27 that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath? Beyond the obvious fact that man is a physical being subject to fatigue, in, in the Sabbath, God is telling us that success and fulfillment await those who seek his ways above man's ways. And there it is. Jesus is the spirit of the Sabbath rest in that he did the will of the one who sent him, which is what we're to do. Jesus was the spirit of the Sabbath rest. We learn from Proverbs 16:9 that a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Sabbath means more than rest, more than relaxation. It also means completion. It means it is finished and it is very good because I let God lead me. Sabbath means more than rest. It also means completion. In Genesis 31, 131, Genesis 131, God looked at all he had made and said, it is good. He said it is very good, as a matter of fact. And in Genesis 2, verses 1 to 2, it says he rested from all his work. And just as it was by the word of God that everything was made and everything was good, very good, so it is that when we live in accordance with God's will, everything will be good. Doing it your way may get you the adoration of the world, but it will also get you the thorns and the thistles of Genesis 3.18. Proverbs 14.12 warns us, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And he will direct your paths. For the Lord my God... <laughs> When we hearken to the Lord and do it his way, 
Whatever it is, do it his way. That's godliness. Then our plans will be fruitful. That's what it means. Then we can say it is good and it is finished. We can find the same truth in Isaiah 58 verses 13 to 14. Which say, and incidentally, Isaiah 58 tells you what fasting is. And I ain't going without food, folks. It's not. That's another ceremony. That's another ritual. All right? Bargaining with God. I make myself so hungry, Lord. So you'll hear, listen to me. Um, so, but the thing is that it starts with fasting, which is very connected. Very, very connected. That's why God knows what he's doing. He started talking about fasting and what really, what it really is according to him, not what it is according to man, moves straight into Sabbath. Here's what it says. At the end of Isaiah 58, from 13 to 14, verses 13 to 14, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, what it's saying here is, if you keep your foot from going your own way, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. If you call it Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. My word. How could it be any plainer? Do it my way, my people. And you will experience rest. What rest? Not relaxation. But completion. Satisfaction. Fulfillment. Success. Right? Like the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the fourth commandment stood as an external sign of the division between the affairs of man and the holy presence of God. Hebrews 10, 19 to 20 explains it this way. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest of, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, hear me, hear me, hear me on this way, by a new and living way, not ceremony, not ritual, not Sabbath keeping as a day, by a new and, and living way, by the blood of Jesus. When he consecrated us through the veil, what is the veil? That is his flesh. What was removed when that veil was removed was the flesh. The flesh. Now, not the body. It's not the body, folks. It's the fleshly mind. Right? My way, God, not yours. That's flesh. Sabbath rest is your way, Lord, not mine. Am I clear? Remember that Jesus was in hypostatic union and his flesh stood as our carnal nature. Because of Christ's atoning death, his sacrifice on the, the Sabbath day has been removed as an ordinance. It's no longer an ordinance. The Jews are going to keep it. They're going to keep it as long as they're Jews. But one day, they're going to bow down and worship Jesus. And when they do, they will have fulfilled what was really there from the very beginning. God's promised rest remains only as a symbol of being led by the Spirit of God in Christ Jesus. In Jesus, God is with us. Emmanuel. The sin barrier has been taken away. And we can come into the presence of our Father God in confidence. The sin barrier, the fleshly mind, has been removed if we will let him do it. We can't do it. He has to do it for us. He, that's why he comes into your life and he changes you. Call him. I want you, Lord. You know what? Proverbs 19, 14. 19, verse 14. Proverbs 19, verse 14. One day, many years ago, 
I was reading that. I hadn't long been a Christian. <laughs> I shouldn't admit, I suppose, but I told a fellow that, that you're talking about uh, this young fellow who'd never been in church. I said, well, you know what? <laughs> I was on church until I was 40. So there's always hope, right? Yep. Yeah. So I was reading the scriptures. I had only accepted God maybe a month or so. I'm reading the scriptures and I came to Proverbs 19, verse 14. Look at what it says. Houses and riches are inheritance from the fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I sat there and I said, Lord, I have proven it over and over again. I'm not qualified to select a woman. Please do it for me. And he did. And we've been together, what, 30 years now. So Sabbath's rest is not entered by effort, not by ritual, not by limitation, not by restriction, not by ordinance. Do this, do that. None of that. It's not a special day or a period of inactivity, but by putting aside the flesh and submitting to the Holy Spirit. That is Sabbath rest. It is only ended by God's influence on your heart and his application of his word in your life. It is the grace of God who works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. That's in Philippians 2.13. So here it is in the proverbial nutshell. We finish it up now. Physical, physical rest is only an analogy of what God really wants from us. He wants our submission. It is to, this is to our benefit, not to his benefit. The Sabbath was made for us that we might be conformed to the image of the Son. That's why the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's made for us. The fourth commandment is the interface between man and God. It's that which connects us. When the flesh is removed, then we're connected with God. If you cease and desist in doing things your own way, in following the ways of the flesh, and prefer to take delight in God's ways, you will enter into his rest. You will enter into his presence. And here it is, folks. It is not about relaxation. It's about transformation. Yeah. Romans 2.13 says, Not the hearers of the word of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And in James 1.22, it's repeated. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Amen? Amen. I hope, I really hope I got this across. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord. It is fundamental. It is pivotal. I put it right up there, the fourth commandment. Understanding what Sabbath rest truly is, I put it right up there with Romans 12, 1 and 2, to offer yourself a living sacrifice and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed, transfigured by the renewal of your mind, by the intake of Bible doctrine, that you may be a manifestation of divine will. Amen? Amen. 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 There is the tabernacle in the wilderness. The compound surrounding it. Every, every post has a meaning, folks. You got the, the gate, the, even, even the, the, the furnishings and the gate. You walk into the great gate and the first thing you come to is 
the place of, of sacrifice, right? The altar. Offer yourself a living sacrifice. Then you go to the labor. What's the labor? It's a place where they wash. You know what? They look, they look into the labor that's full of water and they see a reflection of themselves. And that's what you do with the word of God. You see a reflection of yourself. And guess what the labor is made out of? What is it made out of, Jim? Brass, yeah, but from what? That's right. Made from brass from the mirrors that the Egyptian women had. That's right. Yep. That's what. Now, a mirror is something you look in and see yourself. Okay. The, tr the symbology is tremendous here. So you go from sacrificing yourself to seeing yourself and then washing in the word, right? They wash and then they go in and every pillar has a place. There are five pillars there and there's grace uh, and they walk through into the holy place which is lit by the menorah. No other light in the whole place. And that's where they worship God but they can't meet with him. You have to go through the veil and the veil could only go, be gone through by the high priest and once a year. And he had to have a rope tied to him in case he died in there in the presence of God because nobody could go in and get him. They had to pull him out. It's phenomenal. That, that I, I could go on for a long time about this, but Pastor Jim, <laughs> listen, if anybody looks deeply into the Word of God, they're going to find out there is a God, by golly, because nobody else could write this book. Nobody 